Hey, good morning. Michael Didier here. We're going on a halak today. A journey, an adventure in Torah. Oh, I love my Father's word. It is the lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It's the way that leads to life. Oh, my word, we're going to talk. Oh, I've got chills. We're going, goosebumps. We're going to talk about the time of life today. Oh, my goodness, it has been lost for thousands of years. I've never heard anybody talk about the time of life. But before we do that, we're going to look at what we did last week. Here it is. Yahovah is talking to Abram. He's 99 years old. Remember, he left in Genesis 12 from Haran for Canaan when he was 75. This is 25 years later. He's been married to Sarai for 50 years. 50 years! They haven't had a child. Look at this. This was uh, chapter 15. He's concerned. He's 78 years old. Been married to her for 28 years. Still doesn't have a child, even at that point. He's concerned. I'm childless. I'm barren, he says. Again, this is the first time he's having a conversation with Yehovah. It's a vision. Yehovah has come to him a vision all the time. Today, something new is going to happen. He said, maybe Eliezer, Eliezer of Damascus, maybe he could be my heir. It's all about the heir. He needs an heir. What do we call that heir? The Yarash. He needs a Yarash. Yehovah said, verse, verse uh, 4, here it is up here, let me move it up. And behold, the word of Yehovah came to him, saying, The word of Yehovah came to him, saying, He shall not be thy heir, thy Yarash, but he who will come from thy own body shall be thy heir. And look what the next verse says. This is the New King James. It says, he believed in Yehovah. Believed in Yehovah. Oh, these religious words, they're killers to us. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. Let's look at it in, in my translation. And standing firm in Yehovah, what Yehovah is telling him. He's acting on it. That is what gets counted to him as righteousness. You know what? It's interesting that he hears Yehovah. Hearing Yehovah. There's a few people that hear Yehovah at some point in their life. But you know what? They don't act on what they hear. Abraham acts on what he hears. Yehovah said, leave her. He loved her. Then he went to Haran. Well, you know, I said he was in, in uh, Canaan when he was 75. He actually was in Canaan when he was 50. No, 55. He went to Canaan for 15 years. From 55 to 70, he was in Canaan. He went back to Haran for five years. Taught more men to follow Yehovah, and they joined themselves to him again. And then, in Genesis 12, he finally comes out. But here's a man that when he hears the voice of Yahovah, he acts on it. He doesn't have any, any covenants with the kings of Canaan. None. He's responsible to one 
Elohim, Yehovah. That's it. Nobody else. Well, so that's the context now that we're coming into verse 17. Good. 17. This is where we're at. He's 99 years old. Yehovah comes to him. Remember, this is a review from last week. He says, I am your provider. El Shaddai, the strong authority who provides, has never depended on the governments of men to take care of him. He doesn't need their system of authority, their system of organizations, their laws, their statutes, their judgments. No, he trusts only in Yehovah to provide for him. And this is so interesting at this time of, of his life. We're going to see it's the Moed that's going to be coming in three days. The strong provider. This is the time that all the rest of the world is going to Ishtar, to Venus, and all the other goddesses who represent love and spring and abundance in the land. They're all worshiping Ishtar. But at this time, Yehovah is saying, I will be your Shad. Remember we saw Shad meant, meant uh, here. To the dangle, breast, we are provided for Yehovah's seed, his son, and Abraham's seed are provided for by Yehovah. He's our breast. Oh, what an interesting picture that is. He says, walk before me and be blameless. But now, he's going to say, remember, this is a vision. He's going to tell Abraham something, and he's going to use this word. Here's the word. Bariti. Bariti. That says, my cutting. The word is barit. But it gets translated as what? Covenant. But what is a covenant? We don't know what a covenant is. Whenever there's a covenant being made, blood is being shed. Ooh, blood is being shed. Whose blood is being shed? He says, I will make a cutting, a covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. This word, Bariti is used ten times in this chapter. Three times it says an everlasting Barit, an everlasting cutting. But this is what I want you to see. Verse 10. He says, This is my cutting my cutting which you shall keep between me and now look what he's saying you yell he's been talking to Abraham and he's still talking to Abraham it's all been these and thou's and thy's but now all of a sudden it becomes second person plural this is my cutting which y'all shall keep between me and you and thy descendants. He's talking to me. My descendants, my boys, after thee. He says, look at it. It says every male child. No, that child is not even there. It's added by the scriptures, by the translators. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Do you see a shedding of blood here? 
You should. And you all shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. He's still talking to Abram. No, I take it back. He's now talking to Abraham because he changed his name. Oh, there it is. Yeah, he has already changed his name. Look, it says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. When did Abraham get his name changed? He got his name changed with the cutting. With the covenants. Something new is happening. It's going to be the second birth. This is the second birth. You must be born again. This right here is what we're talking about. It happens at the Moed. I believe they even used the Moed in this very chapter. Remember when Abraham got his name, so did Sarai get a new name. Why? Did she get circumcised? No, but she's bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. When he gets a new name, she gets a new name. When he becomes a son, she becomes a daughter. This is how a woman comes into the kingdom of Elohim, through her man. Oh my goodness, we have learned so many lies. And the Jezebel kingdoms that we live in right now, we can hardly even understand when somebody starts talking about things like this. No, it's about the circumcision and it's about the time of life. Let me see, the very same day. Uh, here it is. Verse 21. Let me move this up to the top of the page. Make it easier for you to see. He says, My cutting I will establish with Isaac. Remember, he said, All your males shall be circumcised on the eighth day. But he says, My cutting I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to thee when at the set time. What is the set time? The set time is right here, the Moed. The Moed. So now what's going to happen? He finishes his vision. And what does he do? Look at, here's what he does. This is the, the, the right down at the bottom. I'm going to move this up again. He says that very same day, the very same day that he got the vision, Abram was circumcised and his son Ishmael, all the men of his house, born in his house. I think that should say all the men of his house, colon, born in his house, or bought with money. I guess there would be men that actually joined himself to, to him as well. So men who joined, maybe those are the men of his house. Those men who have joined himself to them, those men who are born in his house, he has servants, lots of people are being born in his house. Remember, this is when he left Canaan in Genesis 12. He had probably a thousand people with him, probably 600 men. But this is 25 years later. We're probably close to 2,000 people and more than a thousand males in his house. Those who have joined themselves, those who have been born since they joined themselves, and those who have been bought with money. Well, Last week we talked about circumcising all these men. Bought with money. I want to go to Exodus 12:48 ish. That's one of the two verses I want to show you. Here it is. 
first, for, first I want to start with 44. But every man's servant, every man's, he's talking about us. Remember, he always talks to Israel. He talks, about the, he talks to the Ezra. Always talks to the Ezra. Every man's servant who is bought with money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. Okay? So if you bought your servant with money, he's your personal servant. He's yours forever until you sell him. But he's there for good. He doesn't have a choice to leave. Now, look what it says in verse 48. And when a stranger dwells with you, remember the stranger is the one who has joined himself to Yehovah and his kingdom, to the Ezra. He dwells with the Ezra in their land. But now, there's one time per each year, well, I guess two times if you consider second Passover, huh? There's two times each year that the Ger can draw near, be circumcised. Look what it says. And when the Ger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to Yehovah, remember, if he doesn't keep the Passover, he gets kicked out of the nation and his sins remain on him. Let all his males be circumcised. So he's got males as well. His males aren't your males, but he dwells with you. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as, look what it says, a native of the land. One, two, three, four, five words is really one Hebrew word called Ezra. He shall be an Ezra. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells with you. Nobody's a stranger if they still are serving other Elohim, other lawmakers and judges. That's a tow shop. See, we are filled right now with a world that has tow shop citizens of other countries who are learning to keep the Sabbath, learning to eat clean, they think, learning to eat clean. There's so much more to that. It's not keeping the bad feasts, the holiday feasts, man's feast, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, those kinds of things. And now, starting to learn and do the feasts of Yehovah. But they never left the kingdom of their birth. He never told them to do any of those commandments. No. What makes you Yehovah's people? You become Yehovah's people. A man becomes Yehovah's people. How? by leaving the kingdom of his birth and joining himself to Yehovah, just like Abraham did. He only follows Yehovah. What did Yeshua say? Or only serve one master. Well, Yehovah says the same thing over and over and over. No, we have served other Elohim and we're not supposed to serve other Elohim. We don't have covenants with those people. We got to get rid of those covenants to be his people. So this is the circumcision. Okay, these are the men who have all come out. They've joined themselves to Abraham. They don't serve the Elohim of Canaan. They don't serve the Elohim of Haran. They don't serve the Elohim of Babylon. They serve only one Adonai, Abraham. And Abraham said, y'all got to be circumcised. Well, he set the example. What did we say? It was him and then Ishmael, his son. But not the seed, the son. Then the men who were born in his house, or the men who joined themselves to him, then the men of the house and those bought with money. I think it's interesting the order that they have it in. Well, so now this finishes the vision that he acted on. But now, look at what happens. This is the start of the very next chapter. Okay, here's 18. Now look what it says. This is my new King James. Then Yehovah appeared to him by the terebinth tree of memory. And he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Well, look what we have here. This is a hanging pronoun. 
Then Yehovah appeared to him. Who's him? You know what? I always knew this, this had to be Abram. I just assumed it was Abram. But it does, it's not attached. It's a hanging pronoun. But we got to remember that there are no chapters in Torah. No verses. This is continuing from the last chapter as far as we're concerned. So we're still talking about Abram. They have then. I would say and. It's a vav. It's connecting the past with the present. But now, look what it says. It says, then Yehovah appeared to him. Well, there's actually two words that they translate as appeared. I think they do it in injustice. And I think they do it because they do not want to see what the Torah actually says. Here's what it really says. It says, and he saw coming towards him, Yehovah. And he saw, look at, they put this word on it, Ra'ah. The word isn't Ra'ah, the word is Ra. There's Ra'ah. Resh, Aleph, Hey. Do you see that? Well, here's the word. Resh, Aleph, Ra. There's no Hey added to it. Ra'ah. It's Ra. Here, I mean, I'm going to do this because I want you to see this more clearly. This is, you know, Strong's doesn't want you to see these kinds of things. He saw. Here's, here's, here's the word. Let's go there. You can click on this in Esword and then down here at the bottom. Let me see if I can close this. There, down at the bottom, you see this where it says 7200 down here at the very bottom? That lets you know that the dictionary sees it. And so now when you go to the dictionary, you can see 7200. Ah, I want to go to the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible. And I want to make this bigger so you can see it. Here's Ra. This is the word that we're talking about. Ra, ah, it means see. Wade says, I don't see anything. Oh, you're right. I lost my, uh, thank you for saying that, Wade. I lost my desktop. Let me turn the desktop back on. At any rate, we're talking about seeing. He's seeing. He's seeing somebody coming towards him. It says, appeared to him. No, I want you to see this different. This is somebody that he see. He's sitting at the door of his tent. Somebody, oh, look. Look, honey, somebody's coming. Oh, I know them. This is what we're talking about. He saw someone coming toward him. This is the other word right here is L. Denoting motion towards. Somebody's drawing near to him. What, what do you picture? Uh, he's at his tent. Here's what, what. Then Yehovah appeared to him at the terab by the terabith tree of Mamre. Poof! Here's Yehovah. Is that what we picture? I think it is what we picture. No. He's sitting in the tent in the heat of the day. Why is he sitting there? We'll find out in a moment. I want to talk to you about this, understanding who this is coming towards him. And he saw coming towards him, Yehovah. Yehovah? Yehovah is spirit. Spirit Elohim. You can't see him. How is he coming towards him? Here he is coming towards him. Who is it? Well, there's much that we need to understand that's going to impact this day, but it's also going to impact the future of people 
in this world. Let me finish reading the verse. And he saw coming towards him Yehovah by Mamre's strong tree. This word is about a strong tree, probably an oak. I'm guessing that this is a an oak that survived the flood. And that is the very reason why it's probably a thousand years old right now. And that's the reason why it is known as the oak. The oak, the strong tree. Mamre's strong tree. Oh, you know the oak tree over by Mamre? Yeah, I know that place. Well, that's where Abraham was. See, this is how they identify things in these days. Remember, let's understand the timeline. The flood was 1,650 years, approximately. It's 1,658, I think it was. The birth of Abraham is 1948, 300 years later. Here's a picture of the oak. At least that's what we assume is the oak of Mamre. Let me see if this will open. It says it's 5,000 years old. So if, if Abraham is what? Uh, at this point, he would be uh, uh, 1948, 2048. Okay, 2048, 20. 2,048 years after creation and now we're approaching 6,000 years after creation getting ready to start the new millennium and the last millennium in the world as we know it 5,000 year old so this is this is an oak tree that's been around for quite some time, since about the year 500, maybe a little bit later than that, Eight, 800, the year 800. It's the tree. Everybody knows the tree. They translated as plains of memory. They translated as the uh, terabit trees. Oh, it's terrible translations of what they do to these kinds of things. But the day that I noticed that 18 followed 17, duh, I know, you know, you just sometimes you don't think. We just don't engage our minds. But I realized when I was reading Yasher that 17 followed eight, or 18 followed 17. Look what it says. Here it is on the right. And in the third day, Abram went out of his tent. This is the third day after he circumcised himself. And out of his tent and sat in the door to enjoy the heat of the sun during the pain of his flesh. He was in pain and getting comfort when Yehovah appears. How does Yehovah appear to him? Yahovah is spirit Elohim. Let me move this up. We cannot see him, but Abraham recognizes Yahovah in these three men. He said, My master, do not pass by your servant. Adonai, do not pass by your servant. Now, is he talking to Elohim? Well, yes and no. In the last days, the world will see Yehovah in his called out men as well. What's going on here? And why is there perversions going on in these translations? I think it's too coddle their theological viewpoints and rather than taking the time to understand what we're going to talk about right now the shalak who speaks for Yahovah they try to make it actually Yahovah 
Oh, I've heard people say, well, this is Jesus. Don't you know he's talking to Jesus? Oh, brother, lost in ignorance. You know, this is the problem when we try and make everything about Yeshua. We can't see the light for the darkness that we pulled over our eyes. Look what it says. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them and bowed down to the ground. Well, here's, here's uh, what I wrote concerning this. It says, these three men, they're en noshim, en noshim. Okay, it's the plural form of ish, en noshim. They're men. These three men are Yehovah's shalakim. Shalakim, shalak, plural form of shalak is shalakim, his sent ones. They sound like they are Elohim himself because they speak for him. Remember Eliezer? Many of you have heard me say this before. We've got new people in the class. I want them to hear this. Remember Eliezer was sent by Abram to get a bride for Isaac. What he said was if Abram, Abraham, had said it. What he did as if, it was as if Abraham had done it. He's acting as his sent one. The decisions that he made were as if Abraham had made them. And the money that he paid was as if Abram had paid it. He is acting on behalf of Abram. And that is exactly what's going on in this chapter. Three men. Who are these three men? It says, Enoshim. But Numbers 23 says, God is not a niche, not a niche, that he should lie, nor a son of Adam, that he should repent. Has he not said, and he will not do? Or has he spoken, and he will not make it good? No, we're talking about shlocks. Look at what it says in Genesis 19.13. Talking about the same men, only two of them this time. He says, For we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of Yehovah. We will destroy this place. And Yehovah shall send us. There's the word, send us. And he shall send, this is, this is and, right here, and he shall, he shall, here's the send, the shalak, and then the noon, and the vav says us. He will send us, shalakim, where are the shalakim? To destroy it. They are Yehovah's Shalakim, his sent ones. Everyone can see them, hear them, touch them, even feed them. It's he that sends us. He shall send us. That's what it says in, in that Hebrew word. He and he shall send us. Well, who are these three men? He recognizes Yahovah in these three men like that. How? Why? Is it possible that he knows them? Is it possible that they could be some of the men who he was actually raised with? Who he grew up with, talked to every day? My first inclination was to think that it might be Noah, Shem, and Eber. But I realized Noah had died when he was 58. So it has to be Shem and Eber and one other. These are men 
who know Yehovah, respected men that he would call Adonai. They are his Adonai. Shem's the Mel Melchizedek, the king of the righteous. He recognizes them. I want you to see that the shalak is often confused with Yehovah. I think this is, if, if Yeshua really did come, and I really have serious doubts as if there was even a man ever that even walked the earth called Yeshua. It really doesn't matter. He can't change anything. You can't add to Yehovah's words. You can't take away from Yehovah's words given through Moses. But if there was a man like that, at best, he was a sent one to turn people back to Yehovah. Maybe I'm a sent one. Turning people back to Yehovah, his kingdom. I don't know any other teachers that turn people back to their, his kingdom. Say, leave the United States. Leave the covenants. Get rid of those things, men. They're killing you. Well, look what Yehovah said to Moses. Here it is. Exodus 4. 14 through 16. So the anger of Yehovah was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levi? Remember, he says, I, I can't speak. I'm poor. I, I have bad voice. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he also is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he sees thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now thou shalt speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach thee what thou shalt do. So he shall be thy spokesman to the people. And he himself, listen to what it says. And he himself shall be a mouth to thee, and thou shalt be to him as Elohim. Hear that? Thou, Moses, is going to be an Elohim as Elohim to Aaron. Now, here's one more verse. This is talking about Pharaoh. So Yehovah said to Moses, See, I have made you as Elohim to Pharaoh. You know what? There's a lot of things that Moses did for Pharaoh that Yehovah, as far as plagues are concerned, that Yehovah never told him to do. He just did them. How can he do that? Because he is speaking for Elohim. He is the Shalak the sent one. What he says as if, as if Yehovah said it. I have made you as Elohim to Pharaoh. In the last days, people are going to see the 144,000 ish. Remember, that's a New Testament number. We're talking about the servants, the 144,000 servants, or let's just say the servants that Yehovah scattered throughout the whole earth because of our disobedience and serving other Elohim. But now those men are starting to come out, leave the kingdom of their birth, joining themselves to Yehovah, becoming his gear, circumcising their hearts, and then at Passover, circumcising their flesh and becoming as Ra. That is how a nation is going to be born in a day. It's going to happen sometime in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to. I put soon Yehovah will send his 144,000 Ishelakim to destroy the whole earth. That too will happen right after Passover. Ooh, today we're looking at what's going on at Passover. Yehovah meets with his men at the Moed. 
and this is what's happening to you. He said that the child would be born at the Moed. Now, remember, he said that in a vision three days ago. Now, here's the Shalakim, flesh and blood, confirming what Yehovah told him in a vision. Wow. Wow. Yehovah said that to me three days ago. You won't believe it. Now, he's, now you're saying it. Abram called them Adonai. Adonai, that's kind of weird because Adonai is singular. It's not Adonim, it's Adonai. My lords or master, I think, would have been more appropriate. The next verse says, rest yourselves. We're talking about more than one, aren't we? I use this green here this bright green to help you understand that these are the men that we confuse for Yehovah. They're the Shalakim. In uh, 19, the very next chapter, when Lot meets the two that come down, he calls them my lords. Really, in the Hebrew, it still says Adonai, but they translate it as my lords. I don't understand why it doesn't have the plural form there. But we see lots of kinds of things in Torah as we go through it. Okay. My lords, if I have found favor in your eye, your sight, do not pass by your servant. Abram is their servant. I think this again gives us more credibility for understanding these men as Shem and Eber and one other. You know, there's other righteous men in the earth. But it's being focused on Abram right now, Abraham. He's going to be the father. The Remember last week we were talking about the exalted, the high father. Okay, a father is normally over flesh and blood. But the exalted father, Abram, we talked about it last week, was a, a, a new dimension. It's the spiritual dimension, the exalted father over spiritual seed. Oh my goodness. Verse 4. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet. Rest yourselves under, look what it says, under the tree. The tree. There's the tree. Memories oak. That old tree that's been around for so long made it through the flood, that tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts after, you, after that you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. Again, he's their servants. So Abram hurried into the tent to Sarah and said quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. Well, this is the first time in this chapter that Abram's name is actually being mentioned. Oh, we were talking about Abram all this time. Oh, I get it. Make cakes. You gonna have time to raise? Don't think so. Could these be unleavened bread? Just for the guests? She's making it and they are eating it before they head down to Sodom. Ooh, this Moed in relation to what's going on in Sodom in the next chapter is extremely important to understanding what's going to happen in these last days. Verse 7. And Abram ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, and gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. What's going on here? Who's the young man? Young man. That's funny. Uh, here, 
uh, Yasher 18.6 says this, gives us a little bit more light into what's going on. And Abram ran and took a calf, tender and good. And he hastened to slaughter it and gave it to his servant Eliezer to dress. His senior servant is going to be the one who's going to dress it. He already slaughtered it. But look at the next verse. I always get a kick out of this. The Jews, you know, they have a big to-do about eating uh, dairy products with meat. They won't do it. they got to keep them on separate plates or even in separate meals. But look at this. Uh, so he took butter and milk and the calf, which he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree. There's the tree again. And they ate. Is this the Passover meal that we're talking about, possibly? I think this is Passover evening. I think this is probably the 14th day of Aviv. And I say that for a lot of reasons. We're going to go into them as we go piece by piece here. Now, I don't think the Passover was quite as refined as it is in the, the instructions that we received from Moses in Egypt in Exodus 12. He's using a tender calf. Look what it says. Verse 9. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your woman? Remember, there is no word for wife in Torah. His woman is what we call a wife. But remember, in Genesis 16, Sarai, gave, Sarai, Abram's woman, gave Abram Hagar as a woman for him. Not his woman, a woman for him. That's the difference between a wife and a concubine. The concubine is going to give him a son. That His son's name was Ishmael. But he wasn't the chosen one. He wasn't the seed that was that was prophesied uh, that we would leave Egypt 400 years after the birth of Abram's seed, which is Isaac. We saw that two weeks ago. He said she's in the tent. Sarah's not with them. The men talk by themselves. They don't have the ladies with them. And he said, this is again the Yehovah, makes it sound like Yehovah saying it. This is the Shalak that's saying it. But it's like Yehovah saying it. Okay, it is, and it isn't. That's what we got to understand. There's, it is and it isn't. It is Yehovah, but it isn't Yehovah. It's Yehovah's agent. Let's call him an agent. That's a good word, and we understand that in the context of today's. An agent acts on behalf of the one who gives him the agency. Verse 10, And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. The time of life. And behold, Sarah, your woman, thy woman, shall have a son. So Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. She's still listening. She's not part of the conversation, but she's listening. But I think it's interesting here. It's talking about the time of life. You know, when I first saw this, my inclination was, and I think this is what the whole world does, they think spring the time of life when things are starting to bloom again but this is not what we're talking about remember that's what the whole rest of the world is doing that's what Easter's about spring equinox we may get to it today maybe not we're going pretty slow 
I will return to thee according to the time of life. The time of life. And behold, Sarah, your woman, shall have a son. The son is going to be born on the time of life. Do you start to see a shadow picture going on here? The spiritual son. They've been barren for 50 years. Now a son's going to be born to them 50 years after they are, are married? Married. After he takes her? Again, a Christian word, English word. There's so many things that are hard to understand in the Hebrew because we just don't have the, the vocabulary to express it. Oh, here, I want to just go through this. Uh, Right-hand side there, it says, Sarah is going to have a son at the, at the time of life. Here's uh, Genesis 17. This is the last, last week what we covered. Then Elohim said, No, Sarah thy woman shall bear thee a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my cutting with him for an everlasting cutting, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard, I have heard thee. Uh, I want to go down to the bottom. Uh, but my cutting I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to thee at this set time next year. This is chapter 17, three days before. They're anticipating what's going to happen here when Elohim's going to appear to him. And this is Elohim appearing to him in the form of his shalak. It's, it is what's going on this set time. First, Jehovah tells him in a vision. Now, here's the man, the Shalakim, the Enoshim, telling him exactly the same thing. The time of life, the set time. You're going to have a son next year at the time of life. He says, is anything too hard for Yehovah at the appointed time? I think that's the next verse. No, I guess it's still coming. Uh, at the appointed time, the Moed, I will return according to the time of life. Well, there's just more evidence that the time of life is the Moed. Verse 11. Now Abram and Sarah were old. This is kind of a of uh, let's give you a little bit more information before we go on with the story type of thing. Now Abram and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So what's happening now? She's listening at the tent door. It says, therefore Sarah laughed within herself. Not out loud, she laughed within herself. Saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also, my master being old also? Did you hear that? Abraham is Sarah's master. When a man takes a woman and baals her, baals, it gets translated as married. But it's Baal's. He Baal's her. He becomes her master. She's calling him my master. I hate this, this the Lord. They, they, they always want to use my Lord. Uh, and I think it, it distracts us because we call Yehovah the Lord. They call Jesus the Lord. And so we get totally confused because we've changed the name of Yehovah to the Lord. No, it becomes confusing to us. Again, religious words. I'd much rather have this translated Adonai as my master, which is how you all practically always see me write it, my master. I just do not want to write my Lord. It's confusing to us. Next verse. And Yahovah, here it is, Yahovah said to Abram, why did Sarah laugh, saying, sure, sure, Shall I surely bear, since I am old? She laughed. 
Why did Sarah laugh? This word, this is an interesting word. Here's the word that gets translated as laughed. It says, to laugh outright. In merriment or scorn. Okay, was she laughing outright or was she laughing inwardly in merriment or scorn? In scorn. Maybe that's a little harsh, but certainly in sarcasm. Yeah, right. Shall I bear when I'm old and my man being older than I? Shall I take pleasure? You know what? The shellac called her on it. She's already malunoed Abram. Do you remember when she malunoed Abram? Do you remember that word we talked about maluno? It's actually a, a Greek word meaning defile, muddy, stain, or otherwise dirty a man. Abram was supposed to wait for the promised child. But in 16, Genesis 16, she gave Abram Hagar. And they had Ishmael trying to do something in the flesh instead of waiting in the spirit for Yehovah to do it. So now here she is laughing. He just told Abram, this time next year you're going to have a son at the Moed. The time of life. Oh, I love that word, the time of life. Gonna have a son. But she's laughing. You know what? That laughter is going to come out later when the shellac leaves. Abram's talking to him right now. Is this possibly why the women aren't involved in the conversations like this? I wonder. Look what it says in Micah. He says, do not trust a friend. Do not put thy confidence in a companion. Guard the door of thy mouth. Look what it says. From her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. You know what? When I came to Yehovah, when I started to leave the world, getting rid of driver's licenses and social security numbers and all the things that bound me to the governments of men, that is when I started getting persecution. My woman wanted me. Now, I didn't call her a woman in those days. I called her my wife. I didn't know any better. My woman wanted me to be normal, raise our kids up like everybody else, the broad road. And it's when you separate and do what you're supposed to do that you run into problems. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Guard your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. Maybe Sarai shouldn't even have heard that. Could Abram still act on it? No, she got rebuked. And I think it was because the shellac wanted to ward off future problems in this next year. Remember, there's things going on. He's going to go in this next year. He's going to go to the Philistines. They're going to take Sarah again. But Yehovah is going to see. That's like the climax of the story. 50, no, 25 years he's been in Canaan. Now, when he's finally going to have the child born, she's getting ready to be given to another man. Oh, no! 
No, the, the seed, the promised seed has got to come from who? His own body, her, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. All right, next verse. He says, is anything too hard for Yehovah? Is anything too hard for Yehovah? This is Yehovah saying, is anything too hard for Yehovah? Doesn't make sense, does it? This is supposedly Yehovah speaking, but now he's being talked about in the third person. Is anything too hard for Yehovah? The spiritually born sons and son, in this case, Isaac, is birthed on the time of life. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is when the Ger becomes the Ezra, the new man. The new man. We talk about the new man. Well, I don't talk about the new man, but lots of people talk about the new man in Paul's teaching. But the new man that we're talking about is the Ezra. The recreated man who is now brought back into union with Yehovah. Restoring the glory and the honor and the immortality to that man. And it's done at Passover for each individual man who will do it. But first, you got to leave the kingdom of your birth. There's lots of people that may be taking a real Passover. You know, I'm not talking about a Seder. I'm talking about slaughter your goat, slaughter your lamb, put the blood on the doorstops, and stay in your house till morning. That's the Passover. Foot washing? No, that's not a Passover. Seder? No, that's not in the scriptures. What else do they do? Uh, foot washing? Oh, communion? Not in the scriptures. Testament has done all kinds of things to turn you away from Yehovah's word. Look at Sodom was destroyed on a Passover. The two messengers knew what was righteous by seeing who kept Passover, perhaps just like the angels of death in Egypt. Egypt was brought to her knees on Passover. Remember, if you don't keep Passover, what happens? You get kicked out of the land and the sin remains on you. Numbers 9. Lot brought the two messengers into his house that evening. Ooh, we have a lot more to say about that. Let's continue. And Abram came near to him, and came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Time of life. Here's the time of life. You know what? I don't even want that in there anymore. These two words are only translated into the phrase time of life. In Genesis 18, 10, and 14. Time of life. Time. It's a period. Life. Live. When the stomach is empty, one is famished and weak, and when it is filled, one is revived. Oh, this organ is seen as the life, as an empty stomach is like death, but revived stomach is life. Ooh, we're getting the bread of life to fill our stomach and give us life. Remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yehovah. Not the mouth of Jesus, not the mouth of Paul, not the mouth of John and Jude and Timothy and whoever. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. No, the mouth of Yehovah. I don't remember reading this before. I'll, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, the second reference, verse 14, again, the appointed time, where we're in right now. 
the second reference, verse 14, is more interesting than the first. It reads, is anyone too, is anything too hard for Yehovah? At the appointed time, the Moed, I will return to you according to the time of life. It ties the two together. Sarah shall have a son. It is interesting that this Passover is when Isaac was born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac was the only one of the three that never needed to be renamed. Yeah, Isaac was never renamed, was he? That's interesting. Isaac never left the land. Never left the, the land of Canaan. Yehovah wouldn't allow it. Abram wouldn't allow it. And as Abram became and as Abram became Abram and Jacob became I, Israel, Isaac never left the land of his birth. Well, there it is right there. Well, the other two did. Of all the biological offspring of Abram, Listed in Genesis 25, only Isaac was the heir. I may be biased, but all this leads me to believe that Isaac was born on, or certainly near, the Passover. No, I think he was born on the time of life, the Passover. Just how all of Abram's seed are born at the time of life, the Passover, after they've been circumcised. See, this is my. This is I probably wrote this years ago. Uh, I would have tossed out the time of life phrase as referring to the time of spring, but I can not do that with the appointed time, the moed, being used in conjunction with that phrase. No, you can't do it. And then when you add the the unleavened bread of the next chapter, you get the same situation here's the unleavened bread but he insisted strongly so they turned into the entire house or turned into entered into his house then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate how many people say hey come on over i just made a fresh batch of unleavened bread not no there's something different going on here and it makes perfect sense that he would not let them spend the night in the city because he knew they had to be indoors on the time of life. Well, let's continue. 14, 15. And Sarah denied it. Oh, Sarah. She left. Sarah says, I didn't laugh. She says, for I was afraid. And he said, no. But you did laugh. Well, he dropped it there. And the man rose. Here again, same word, Enoshim. Only now it's Ha Enoshim. The man rose. From there and looked towards Sodom. And Abram went with them to send, there's that word, shalak, to send them, to send them, is what it says, away. And Yehovah said, shall I hide from Abram what I'm doing? Who's he talking to? Not to Abraham. So he's got to be talking to who? The other two men, doesn't he? Since Abraham shall surely become a... Oh, this is a great verse. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become... It says, shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. What's going on here? You realize we're talking about two different kinds of people here. Abram shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Ah, it's so hard to read it in the English uh, and understand it correctly. Here's here's uh, what it actually says: Surely, or Abraham sh shall surely become. It's 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 haya haya. Two different forms of haya. Same word two different forms. Haya, haya. Surely become. The, this is showing the, the certainty of what is going to happen. Haya, haya. 
Remember, when he wants to make a point, he repeats himself. Shall surely become, surely become. This is a certainty. For people. Great. A people great. It's, look at, it's goy. Va goy, va and gadal. Goy, gadal. People great. And this word here, atsum, atsum, atsum. Sounds Japanese to me. Atsum, atsum. Abundance, mighty. Gets translated as mighty. But there's more to it than that. It's, it's a great people, a great nation, a strong and powerful nation. We're going to see this. Goyi Gadal. Goyi Gadal. But now it's con contrasting the Goyi Gadal, the great nation, mighty. And it says this and abundant, mighty, and he shall bless all the earth's people. So we're talking about the Goyi Gadal, the people great, and now we're talking about the Goyi Haaretz. Goyi Haaretz. This is the earth people. We have the great people and we have the earth people. Two different things. The great people bless the earth people. How? This, see this yod here? The, the root for this word, goy, is, is this word right here. That's, that's the root. This makes it possessive. It's the earth people. You see that? This is how it is with Bene Israel. Ben is the son, or in that case, I would say the seed. It's Israel's seed, just like it's the, the earth's people. Same construction using that, that vav to show the possession. Well, you can't be Israel's seed and the earth's people at the same time. You got to be one or the other. This is why no one teaches kingdom. Because they want you to keep your driver's license, your passport, and all the other things that you have, social security numbers, your insurances, and all that stuff, and still say that you're Yehovah's people based on what? You keep a few of his statutes, judgments, and ordinances? Folks, that's not to make you other of his people. That makes you a hypocrite is what that makes. And that makes for greater judgment. No, we're being taught lies. Well, why is this important? Goy Gadal, or Goy Gadal. Goy Gadal, great, great people. Versus Goy Ha Aretz, the earth people. Why is it important? Here's why it's important. I'm glad you asked why it's important. It contrasts those who dwell in heaven serving the Elohim of all creation versus those who dwell on the earth. Serving who? The lawmakers and judges of the kingdoms of men. Two different kingdoms. So here's the next question. It says he's a great, a goy, 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 great, goy gadal. People great. What makes this abundant people great? What makes this mighty people great? Well, that reminded me of this verse, and it uses this goy, or goy gadal, three different times in four or five verses. Here's what it is. It's in Deuteronomy. Surely I've taught you statutes and judgments. 
Remember, he's always teaching it to who? The men, the Ezra men. They're the great people. The Goy Gadol. Just as Jehovah, my Elohim, commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. The um, the peoples. Which peoples? The peoples of the earth. Who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this, look at what it says. Goy, hi, goy, gadol. Goy, gadol, goy, gadol. It's actually, uh, in English, they translate it as great nation, but it's really nation great. Goy, 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 gadol. But this says, the goy, ha, ha goy, ha, gadol. Ooh, surely Hagoy Hagadal is a wise and understanding, look what it says now, people. Okay, they're both people. Okay, just because it says nation, it gets, they translate nation, Goy, as nation all the time. Okay, remember last week we talked about this very thing. It's an English word that leads us into wrong things. Goy usually gets translated as what? Gentiles or nation. Okay, but here's a great guy. Good guy, great. Talking about Yehovah's men. Abram's seed. A wise and understanding people. Um, in the singular. Here we're using ha-amim. Ha-amim. When we're talking about in the sight of the peoples. But now they're making a distinction. See, they don't understand us as Goy or Goy Gadal. The peoples don't. And so Yahovah is using two different words, Am and Goy, meaning the same thing. We're talking about peoples, but one is Yahovah's peoples, the righteous peoples, the Ezra peoples, always men to separate them from the peoples, always men, of the earth. They say, for what great Goy Gadol is there that has Elohim so near to it as Jehovah our Elohim is to us? For whatever reason, we may call upon him. And what great nation, Goy Gadol, again, is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as Yehovah, as are in the law, which I set before you this day. Well, how are we going to bless them? We're blessing them by being a light in the world, showing them what the Goy Gadal, the people great, are like when they act according to Yahweh's statutes and judgments and ordinances, how they're going to be mighty in the last days, untouchable by the kingdoms of this world. Oh, we have so many false images of what's going to be happening in these last days when Yahovah raises up his servants all over the earth and makes a beacon out of them by putting a pillar of fire and, and, and smoke over them. It's going to be amazing. But we won't always be a blessing to them. We will, and we are. I'm a blessing right now. I'm Jehovah's people, Ezra man, left the kingdom of my birth, came into covenant with him eight, eight years ago, and have done it every year since, maybe nine. He says, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says Jehovah, that it shall no more be said, Jehovah lives who brought Israel's seed from the land of Egypt. But Jehovah lives who brought up Israel's seed from the land of the north and from all the lands where he has driven him. This is what I was just talking about. He's raising up his seed, the dead bones that have been scattered all over the earth. 
and at Passover he's going to breathe new life into them and they're going to be reunited with the Creator. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. Yes, they're going to become the Ezra. Only the Ezra are the heir. Yehovah owns the land. The earth is Yehovah's and all those who dwell in it. His heir are going to inherit the lands and rule the peoples that are left in it. Do you want to be great in the kingdom in the last days? Make yourself holy, Yehovah's. Leave the kingdom of your birth and become the Ezra man at Passover. Look what it says. Behold, I will send for many fishermen. Right now I'm fishing. And they shall fish them. What are you talking about? Being a fishers of men? This is what we're doing. I'm a fisherman. I'm trying to catch people and bring them into the kingdom of Yehovah. Specifically men, not ladies. Ladies, follow your man. You'll be safe. But look what he says. And afterwards, I will send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of every holes and out of the holes of the rocks, including Denver, Colorado. There's no hiding place. From Yehovah's people, from Yehovah and his people, his Shalak, in the last days. 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his sons, sons, there it is, his sons, Benim with the Vav on it, conjugated, says his sons. And his family. Still talking about seed. Still talking about men. The Ger and the Ezra. Only Yahweh's men. The Ger and the Ezra. His servants keep his ways. You shall have one law for the Ger. And, or for the native born. And for the Ger who dwells with you. 20. And Yahweh said. Because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. Is great. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. He's hearing people, help us! They're stealing our, our food. They're stealing our supplies. They're killing us. Great against Sodom and Gomorrah. And because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know what's happening. The two men are going down. They're going to see what is happening. That's why I say, I think it's Passover. They'll know who's keeping Passover, who's not. They know who's out running around after dark. Like everybody? What was going on that day? Oh, we don't know what was going on that day. No, I think that Passover coincided with the spring equinox that particular year. Probably we'll do it again. Then the men, the Enoshim, turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before Jehovah. One of them stayed. Remember, Yehovah is not a man that he should lie. Not a son of, of Adam. And Abram came near and said, Would you, would thou, would thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Would thou also destroy the place and not spare it for the for 50 righteous that were in it? I wonder how many were in the city. I'd love to know how big the city was at this point. Far be it from thee to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked. No, Yehovah will never slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should also be as the wicked. 
far be it from thee, shall not the judge of the earth do right? No. The judge of the earth is going to rule by equity, doing what is right. So, Yehovah said, if I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I, again, we're still talking about the Shalak, he's the one that's talking, will spare the place for their sakes. Then Abram answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes. This is the Enosh man. It doesn't use that word, but this is what we're talking about. The humble man, dust and ashes. I know where I stand. Have taken upon myself to speak to, look what it says, the Lord. No, it doesn't say the Lord. It says Adonai my master, to speak to my master. But again, it confuses us. We see capital L, small o, small r, small d, and many think Yehovah. But it doesn't say Yehovah, it says my master. He's, again, it's the Shalak speaking for Yehovah. Uh, suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy the city for a lack of five? So he said, I, if I find, find there 45, I will not destroy it. Suppose there be 40 there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. I'm going to put this up higher. Then he said, let not Yahovah, let not the Messiah, it confuses me even, let not Adonai be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it for the sake of 30 there. You know, the reason I have these color coding for you to see is I want you to learn to read for yourself with greater understanding. The Lord. What what would you get out of the Lord? Would you get my master? I don't think you would. But I bet you would now. And he said, Indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to my master. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, Let not my master be angry. And I will speak once more. Once more. Once more, suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. So, now look at what it says. So, Yehovah went his way. Went his way. I had to look this up. He walked away. And he, it says, and he walked away. Walked away. Remember I, t I talked in the beginning, halak. We're going on a halak. A halak. They translate this word as halak. But it's not halak. It's luck. Not halak. Halak can be translated as journey, adventure. You don't see it so much in Strong's, but in some of the other. Oh, well, here it is right here. Here's the pictograph. Walk. This is the word we're talking about. Lak. See that? Lamed kaf. And he walked away. This is the Shalak, a man speaking for Yehovah. The pictograph of Muhammad is a picture of a shepherd's staff. The cough is a picture of a palm in the hand. Combined, these mean staff in the palm. A no man traveled on foot with a staff in his hand to provide support in walking as well as a weapon to defend against predators and thieves, animals, and men who would attack him. Ha lak is another word entirely that is more has to do more with it's the root, it has the same root, shares the same root. But it has to do more with a journey or an adventure. Ooh, I think that's really cool. We're going on a halak in Torah, an adventure in Torah. Okay, 
So Yehovah walked away as soon as he had finished speaking with Abram, Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. Now, the last time we were in Yasher, it said that we needed to read 17 and 18. So, we get to go back to Yasher for just a short time today. We don't have much time, but I want to get through this short portion of Yasher because I think it's really interesting in light of something that Balaam said to Balak in his fourth word from Yehovah this last time in a vision with his eyes wide open, he said. Let's talk about this portion in Yasher. Here it is right here. This is where we left off the last time we were in here. I'm not even going to do a review because I don't have time. So this is Yasher 17. And in those days, in the 91st year of the life of Abram. So this is in between the, the time that Yehovah said that the heir would come from his own body and when he was 99 and Yehovah said next year the son will be born. He's 91 right now. And in those days, in the 91st year of the life of Abram, the Katim seed, Katim seed made war with Tubal seed. For when Yehovah had scattered the sons of men, Ha'adam seed, upon the face of the earth, Katim seed went and embodied themselves in the plain of Canopia. Oh, I know this is a little hard to understand. And they built themselves cities there and dwelt where? By the river Tiber. Tabru. We're talking about the Tiber River. The Katim seed, remember, it says the children of Katim. Okay, it's B'nai Katim. Katim seed. The descendants of Katim. They can't be his sons because they're multi generations that we're talking about. So we've got to get past this author's, this translator's understanding of what B'nai Katim means. He puts the children of Katim. Well, the children of Katim aren't building the cities. The children of Katim are not, are not going to war. The children of Katim are not taking the daughters of the of Tubal seed for their own. It's the Katim seed that's doing that. It's the men that are doing that. we got to understand it on a little bit deeper understanding. So, here it says, uh, dwelt in Canopia, and they built themselves cities there and dwelt by the river Tabru. Now, I put together, here is something that we saw it, uh, a while back when we were going through Yasher. Right here. We realized that Katim was Rome. Rome! Oh my gosh! All these years I've been reading Yasher, and just this year I figured out who Katim was. I always said, who the heck is Katim? Why are we talking about Katim? Where are they? I always felt they were in this part of the world, North Africa, Mediterranean, uh, this part of the world. But I never realized they were Rome until I saw the Tiber. The Tiber River! is what we're talking about. And today, we're talking about something even bigger than that. Here is, whoops, i got to go this way. Here's Vatican, Rome, down here. This is a picture that I took from my Google Earth. Funny, they don't even have Rome, they have Vatican City. Oh, I think that is so appropriate in these last days that they would say that. But the other place that we're talking about, which is going to be Tubal, is this town up here called Tuscany. Now, I'll tell you why I say that. Let's go back to the story. They built themselves cities there and dwelt by the river Tiber. Tiber. And Tubal Sea dwelt in Tuscany. There's Tuscany. And they're boundaries 
reach the river Tabru. Their boundary has a has a they have a uh, their the out, outskirts of their land has the Tiber River as a boundary is what they're saying. And Tubal's seed built a city in Tuscana, and they called the name of the city Sabana, after the name of Sabana, the son of Tubal, their father. And they dwelt there unto this day. And it was at that time that Katim seed made war with Tubal seed. And Tubal seed were smitten before Katim seed, and Katim seed caused three hundred, three hundred and seventy men. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Seed are men to fall from Tubal seed, and at that time Tubal seed swore to Katim seed, saying, "You shall not intermarry among us. We're mad at you, and no man, 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 shall give his daughter to any of." Now look at they translated it as Katim seed. This is the same word, B'nai Katim, but they translate it as now, because we're talking about no man giving their daughter, now they're in a pinch. They can't translate it as the children of Katim. They translate it now as the son of Katim. Sons of Katim. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Lack of understanding. For all the daughters of Tubal, Tubal's daughters, were in those days fair. For no woman were then found in the whole earth so fair as the daughters of Tubal, Tubal's daughters. And all who delighted in the beauty of women went to Tubal's daughters and took women for them. And the sons of men, Ha-Adam's seed, kings, who are they? And the sons of men, Kings, princes, who greatly delighted in the beauty of women, took women in those days from Tubal's daughters. And at the end of three years, when Tubal's seed had sworn to Katim's seed not to give them their daughters for women, about twenty men of Katim's seed went to take some of the daughters of Tubal, but they found none. And Tubal's seed kept their oath not to intermarry with them, and they would not break their oaths. And in the days of the harvest of Tubal's seed, the men own the land. It's their harvest. Went into the field to to get the harvest when the young men of Katim assembled and went to the city of Sabina. Remember, this is the Romans now going to Sabina. And each man took a young woman from the daughter, from Tubal's daughters. And they came to their city. So what did they do? They went up north, took the daughters, and brought them home. Brought them home to Rome. Wow. This is so amazing. Look at this story. Here it is. Called The Rape of the Sibines on Legends. Have you heard about the, the Sibines, the Rape of the Sibines? This is what we're talking about. The city Sabina. There it is right there, right above my name, Michael Sabina. This is generally thought of as a myth in secular history. Well, it's not a myth. This is a fact. This event occurred when the patriarch Abram was in his 90s. Isn't that interesting? We saw he's 91. There was even a movie made on this with the title Rape of the Sibines in 1961. Well, there was another movie rape that we see, we'll talk about it in a second, shortly after King Romulus founded Rome. Well, that's what we were just talking about. This battle took place. In order for Rome to grow quickly, a decree was issued. Oh, isn't this interesting? Here's the origins of Rome. How did Rome grow quickly? Look what it says. 
In order for Rome to grow quickly, a decree was issued that any criminals that would come to help colonize Rome would be declared a free man and made a citizen of Rome. Oh, man! This attracted a lot of criminals and caused the son Tubal seed not to intermarry or trade with them. Daniel 11 makes the prophecy about the ships of Katim, the ships of Rome. Ooh, it does. And the Hebrew Old Testament in, in, in uh, uh, Numbers uh, has Katim, has Katim, but the Greek Septuagint version says ships of Rome. Ships of Rome, not ships of Katim. Secular Italian history records that a tribe called Sabini came from the Adriatic Sea, speaking a language called Ascan, and settled in the western coast of Italy. According to Yasher 17, these things started 383 years after the flood of Noah and ended eight years later which is 45 years after the fall of Babylon. Well, this is the basis of the musical. Have you ever watched the musical Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? They stole the, the daughters from a city and then ran off to the mountains, had a child. When the fathers came, they were going to kill them all, but, but there was a child. And so they all said, no, it's my child. First, they, first one lady said, this is my child. But then they said, no, he's my child. No, he's my child. No, he's my child. And so they ended up marrying them all. Remember that story? Great story. If you haven't watched the I like musicals. It's fun. Well, this is the story that this is based on. Let's continue reading. We are, we're running out of time here real quick. And Tubal Seed heard of it. And they went to make war with them, and they could not prevail over them, for the mountains was exceedingly high from them. If we couldn't get over the mountains, the pass is closed because of the snow. In the spring we'll get them. And when they saw they could not prevail over them, they returned to their land. At the revolution of the year, in the spring, the, the Tubal Seed went and hired 10,000 men from those cities that were near them. And they went to war with Katim Seed, with Rome. And Tubal Seed went to war with Katim Seed to destroy their lands and to stress them. And in the engagement, Tubal Seed prevailed over Katim Seed. And Katim Seed, seeing that they were greatly distressed, lifted up the, the children. Now this would be children, tough. Toph. They lifted up the children, Toph, which they had by the daughters of Tubal, Tubal's daughters, upon the wall which they had built, to be before the eyes of Tubal's seed, the dads, seeing that their daughters now have born children. It's been a year. And Katim Seed said, Have you come to make war with your own sons and daughters? That's the top, sons and daughters. And have we not been considered we have we not been considered your flesh and bones from this time till now? And when Tubal Seed, the dads, heard this, they ceased to make war with Katim Seed, and they went away. And they returned to their cities, and Katim Seed at the time assembled and built two cities by the sea, and called one Pertu and the other Ariza. Well, we're going to stop here. We're going to continue next week. Uh, actually, we're going to continue next week in this very next verse, 16. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of my class today. Uh, so nice to have you all here. Uh, I'm going to stay on for questions, but I'm going to say goodbye to all of you who have joined us today. Thank you for joining me. Oh, I got to tell you, uh, this is only going to be good if you see it tomorrow or the next day, but Monday night is the expected new moon 
of the seventh month in Israel. If it's seen, that is Yom Teruah, which means from that evening, the evening of the 14th to the evening of the 15th, is the day of shouting. I've got some very interesting uh, video on my blog about the day of shouting. You should listen to it. It's about 49 minutes long. Uh, but it will help give you greater understanding about what Yom Teruah is all about. The day of shouting, not the day of trumpets. Well, again, thank you for joining me. We'll see you again next week. Bye now.